autonomous city explorer and robot able to explore the city environment by interacting with passersby. Uh, I also have a few messages in the talk on the way. They're a little bit more hidden, and um, I will try to give you an overview first of what what will happen uh, in the talk. Uh, so first, uh, I will talk quite a bit about ACE, the robot entering a public space. It's knowledge representation, human-robot interaction, navigation capabilities, and also issues like user acceptance. And then I will try to discuss a few topics, uh, engineering versus learning, uh, where we can probably and hopefully have a very interesting discussion later on and uh, also tomorrow on the panel. And finally, if time allows me to do so, I have brought a benchmark test uh, for all of you, which uh, I would like to take if time remains. So as you all know, uh, robots, uh, as we have already heard in the previous talk, classically robots are in safety cages. Uh, whenever a human comes and closes, uh, opens a door of the cage, uh, the robot is completely shut down. Uh, they're not really operating in the real world, uh, quite structured scenarios, do mostly repetitive manipulation and assembly tasks. And there's virtually no or very limited interaction with humans. The current directions in research, as you all know, is that humans and robots come closer to each other. A very prominent and particular example is uh, the dancing robots in Japan and many others. So uh, I think and we think it's uh, really an important area where we have very close body contact between humans and robots. And this is a very challenging and fruitful area for interdisciplinary research, not only embodied and uh, things, but, um, but many, many disciplines can learn from this uh, problem setting. Of course, there's also a very strong market motivation, economic issues. Um, like you can see here in the, in the slide, this is a predic prediction by the Japan Robotics Association that the market uh, of personal and service robots will dramatically in increase in the coming 10 to 15 years. So you can see the, the red portion uh, going from insignificant year in 2000 to like half of the market in 2025. And this is... Uh, uh, actually happening, I, I believe. Um, there's a lot of demographic issues also related to this um, in many uh, industrial, industrialized nations in Japan, Korea, Germany, Europe, other nations in Europe and in the United States, different problems. But in general, we have these dem demographic issues where we have uh, people elder, older than 65 years old uh, forming a tremendous and uh, significant portion of the overall population. It's actually quite interesting to know that the acceleration of this problem is highest in China because of the one-child policy. You can imagine that the problems will be even larger in China. There's also uh, challenges in human-robot interaction, and we strongly believe in in Munich in our group, an institute, larger institute, also in other groups in Munich, that the adaptation to humans on an individual basis is very important. Uh, what is also very important in the things we do is physical interaction, physical contact. So you can see here a robot like carrying, uh, carrying a, a, an object together with a human, and you have a closed physical contact between robot and human. This closes a very interesting kinematic chain which is very hard to control by any sort of control, uh, whether it's coming from control theory or from embodied cognition, embodied AI. Um, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty also when the human is involved in this control loop, so the human operator is not easily predictable. It's uh, rather compliant, and there's a lot of uh, so very interesting and challenging social, ethical, and legal aspects in this problem too. And one emphasis to, make, to be made here is um, this should be as, as close to application relevance as possibly as is possible. So it should certainly be a real world uh, operation, real world manipulation with some, hopefully some application potential. And uh, we're trying to explore uh, basic, these uh, areas in basic research and applied research in 
in a larger German national project, the Center of Excellence Cognition for Technical Systems. And this is just to, to <clears throat> mention here that uh, uh, we have here a block which is uh, hard to read. It's perception. You have some cognition and actuators uh, forming action in the environment. And what you see here is the closed loop with energy exchange, where you have an en energy exchange with the environment and you have a system closing this loop. You probably also would have, like to have some functions like learning and knowledge uh, representation. And the way this center of excellence is approaching this area is from a fundamental point of view in neurocognitive and psychological foundations. And then we have a number of more co computer science and in engineering affine areas like perception visual image processing and the like, learning, knowledge, representation, control, interaction, and we have a number of demonstration scenarios where we try to demonstrate our results in application near domains. So, and ACE is one of, one of those uh, practical implementations, uh, robot able to explore the city. And uh, when we started the project, uh, which was actually defined by master students and uh, junior PhD students. It, uh, the problem in the initial setting was very interesting, so we wanted to have this robot go from the university to a central location in Munich to Marienplatz, which is the city center. The distance, uh, I'll come back to that later. And the robot, the problem setting was that the robot does not have any map knowledge and not any GPS information. So no map knowledge, no GPS information. And the only way for the robot to find its way to Marienplatz, to the city center, is by asking people for directions. So this was the, the problem setting in the initial uh, definition. Um, we were also uh, interested, uh, of course, in a lot of acceptance issues. So how would people react to this robot? And uh, many, many interesting things. Uh, so this, the, this puts the project in a very interesting research area. So you can see here the, uh, the typical like mainstream research fields in modern robotics. Um, like we try to divide them in two groups. It's navigation and interaction. So you typically have um, navigation and sorts of high performance navigation in structured or semi-structured outdoor environments like in the DARPA, urban, grand challenges, uh, LROP challenges, what, whatever challenges where you have a car trying, trying to find its way around. Um, the navigation problem here is the isolated challenge and the humans are considered as obstacles uh, or they're just completely missing, uh, missing uh, from the challenge at all. And then on the other hand, you have the highly interactive robots like here, uh, the very famous one in Japan, uh, trying to mimic a person as much as possible by speaking and body gestures, motions, and things like that. So very interesting, uh, but different. Two different, completely different problem. And uh, the ACE robot, or the Euro project, which is an ongoing European project continuing our efforts in this area, is uh, somewhat in between. So it has some navigational aspects, although we do not assume map knowledge or GPS information. And it certainly has a very strong interactive component because we have to ask people. We have to ask people for directions. So this is uh, basically the problem, problem setting. And I will now talk a little bit about the hardware and software architecture of this robot. So this is uh, the robot in its version 3.0. You have here a platform, which is a differential wheel platform with a PC to control it. You have a laser range finder, uh, a number of Linux PCs, a lot of batteries, loudspeakers, another laser, laser range finder, a touch screen for interaction. So this is for people to actually enter or touch some of the buttons on the screen. And here you see in this configuration, you see five cameras. So it's a five different cameras can be mounted here on the head. And there's also a very simple animated mouth for interaction. So it's basically two lips trying to move around so that people um, think the robot is speaking to them. Uh, it's overall, it's like roughly person's size. It's a good weight though. So it's 160 kilos. 
that's mainly because of the batteries. Uh, so that's uh, the batteries. Also, of course, uh, the runtime of this robot should be anywhere above like 10 hours. It actually does run for about, uh, up to 18 hours without recharging if necessary. So the, the, this is the video also seen, uh, which was run, running on a loop when some people were already in the room. I just let let this run through. Yes, to the automatic control engineering, technical university of Munich, Germany. The goal of the project was to create a robot that is capable of finding a designated go location in an unknown urban environment. The robot consists of a differential wheel mobile platform. Two laser range finders, a touch screen, a loudspeaker, and a multifocal camera head. The robot was supposed to find its way from the campus of the Technical University of Munich to Marienplatz, the central square of Munich. ACE was given neither a GPS sensor nor map knowledge of the city. It was only allowed to retrieve information through interaction with passers by. In the following, we will explain some of the hardware and software solutions developed to overcome the challenges of navigation, perception, and interactions in unknown urban environments. To localize itself, ACE uses odometry. In essence, it measures the revolution of its wheels. However, even on very smooth ground, wheels tend to slip and skid from time to time, which means that there is a growing error between the measure and the travel distance. To overcome this problem, ACE makes use of a laser rangefinder. This sensor measures the distance in the horizontal plane to objects in the environment. By analyzing the shift of object positions in consecutive range measurements, ACE concludes whether it has actually traveled the measured distance and can thus correct the odometry error. To avoid falling down the sidewalk or other negative obstacles, ACE uses a downward looking laser rangefinder to assess the traversability of the terrain in front of it. The information from this laser is fused with the efficiency grid used for navigation. Using particle filter based SAM, the robot builds a 30 by 30 meter occupancy grid of its surroundings. In this grid, it employs a dual path planning strategy using both the bounding box-based visibility graph planner for open spaces and a Voronoi-based visibility graph planner for narrow passages. To retrieve information about global waypoints, ACE needs to ask pedestrians. It recognizes humans in its vicinity by searching for patterns of human faces in the camera images. Once it has detected a face, ACE approaches the pedestrian and initiates an interaction. Hi. During interaction, ACE asks people to point the way to marine plants. As the robot makes use of multiple cameras, every point in the two-dimensional camera image is assigned a distance in the third dimension. Once it has extracted such a three-dimensional point cloud, ACE attempts to fit the model of a simplified human skeleton into the set of points. It uses the pose of this skeleton to conclude in which direction the human is pointing. Humans provide further round information through buttons on a touch screen. Internally, ACE creates a semantic graph that represents its knowledge about the route. As it makes progress, it associates the graph with the metric occupancy grid and sends the next node to the path planning module as a global waypoint. For safety reasons, ACE cannot simply cross streets, but must stop at intersections and wait. It recognizes intersections by searching for patterns of traffic signs and traffic lights. The robot was trained with about 10,000 example images of traffic signs and lights to learn an abstract representation of the desired patterns. When crossing intersections, ACE has to follow a human for safety reasons. It does so by tracking a teacher with a chessboard pattern on it. On August 31st, 2008, ACE successfully completed its mission, navigating a distance of 1.5 kilometers in approximately 5 hours and interacting with 38 passers-by. Thank you very much for your help. <laughs> Further information can be found at www.ace-robot.de So this...
this uh, this robot is uh, really uh, really an engineering um, challenge. It was an engineering challenge. And you, you can look at the simplified system architecture in this uh, picture. So this is uh, I'd like to show you the the main components of the architecture eventually making the robot run for these five hours and actually completing the mission of 1.5 kilometers to the city center. So it's basically, you see here, three modules, navigation, interaction, and vision. Uh, if you look a little bit more closely, you see here that uh, you have a number of sensors, two laser range find sensors and odometry information. What you then do is uh, use a particular SLAM method uh, and combine that with occupancy grid techniques to eventually uh, get a local representation of the environment uh, uh, in the robot, around the robot and then in the area it has to know. And in that uh, local occupancy grid, what you can do, of course, is use standard path planning techniques. Uh, you have eventually have to have behavior control and behavior selection. And this uh, behavior control, behavior selection is in close interaction with the human interaction part. So this is mainly the, the main part. Here inside, uh, we have a very complicated um, algorithm and state machine eventually reasoning also about the correctness of users giving information, uh, reasoning about misinformation. This is what we frequently observe that people do not take the robot seriously and point into the wrong direction. This is actually one of the serious problems to be solved. Eventually, uh, the obstacle avoidance is for local obstacle avoidance. You have seen that the area around the robot in the pedestrian area in Munich is really crowded. And so local obstacle avoidance with fast moving and a lot of moving obstacles is one of the research issues very important with many open problems, I believe. Eventually, the motor commands are given out to the mobile platform and executed. So here, the touch screen uh, in combination with uh, this state machine, the loudspeaker and the screen where you can just tap like uh, distances. The thing I pointed out there, there was a number of choices. So the robot might ask, how, how far do you want me to go? And the robot says like, and the screen will offer like 50 meters, 100 meters, 200 meters, and people can enter the distance, the metric distance on the screen. So they would basically like point the direction, basic direction, and then after that the robot will ask, so how, how far should I go? And people would enter the rough uh, distance to the goal. And uh, vision, of course, also very important, and one of the huge challenge in these cluttered environments outdoors uh, a lot of challenges also in the vision area. Human perception, environment perception, and of course, visual attention. If you have five cameras to look around, it's also important to so decide where to look next. So if you uh, try to abstract this uh, architecture, which I have uh, now discussed in a, in a very um, rough way, uh, you can again find um, interesting views of this architecture. So first, you could uh, discuss this architecture as a hierarchical cognitive architecture. So you have here like the sensors and actuators on the lower levels. You have some reasoning mechanism in the middle and uh, some higher level functionality like a local map and, uh, and, uh, and the vision here on, on the higher level. So you could say here is actuators, control, and perception. And sensors on top. You could also look at this, uh, and what ha what's happening here if you look at this in a hierarchical manner is that in one direction you have abstraction of information and in the other direction you have speci uh, specialization. So for example, and, and specification. So for example, eventually coming down to the mobile platform are actually locomotion commands and going up are more like symbolic information from the lower levels. You could also look, uh, look at this architecture in a way that you say, oh, well, we have the environment here, which is perceived by the visual sensors. It's then fed into a block which we call cognition, planning, interaction control. And then eventually uh, this block gives out commands to the actuators moving the robot around in the environment. So again, here you can see by looking at the architecture this way, 
you can see, nicely see the closed loop, which is closed through the environment and people. You could uh, also then uh, try uh, to further abstract the left part into like a learning and knowledge block here. Uh, and then uh, again, you can say these loops are closed on a number of levels. So you might have an orange loop, which is closer to the signals and senses and a blue loop, which is more of symbolic nature. Uh, so this uh, actually ties in very well with the cognitive system architecture we use in the center. So it's actually a view of this successful architecture um, in, in this framework. So let's talk a little bit about knowledge representations in this robot. Uh, so you uh, might uh, be interested in domain modeling and environment representation. There's a lot of interesting issues here, of course. Uh, but basically, uh, interaction, cognition, reasoning, and knowledge management are probably the most important areas here. It's actually one of the, what I mentioned also in the beginning, uh, one question uh, really hard to answer is, what does the robot learn on its way? And uh, it's actually one of the benchmarking problems we are currently debating in Munich. It's like you send out the robot into the city, and the robot comes back to university, and you ask the robot, so how was your day? Uh, and this is actually really an interesting problem. So the robot explaining to humans on human terms what it learned on its way. And uh, the other question is, what does the robot need to know before? And this is also a very interesting and uh, fundamental question in this area. Um, of course, uh, you have, I mean, if you look at, in five hours, uh, which the robot took to go to the city center, what you have, uh, you have massive amounts of sensor data. So there's a lot of the five cameras, odometry, and laser range scanners. So there's a lot of information in this uh, in this uh, task when the robot completes the task, and you need to um, look at this uh, very careful. Maybe also on a hierarchical view, in a hierarchical view, where you have here. Um, a metric map, a navigation map, which is more like a graph structure, a conceptual map, and a topological map. And uh, there's, of course, lots of issues in all of these uh, hierarchical levels. You have a local occupancy grid, so you can see here this is a typical slam occupancy grid of, of a street, which uh, then the robot makes a right turn. and. Uh, you might abstract this to a more graph theoretic representation where you just connect a few, no, a few nodes here in a graph structure, which you can uh, very easily use for efficient path planning. And uh, as you go up, you might also try to have spatial relations between objects. So you might have something like a corridor, an area, a traffic light and so on, and you might have representations and relations to these objects. And of course, on the highest level, you might have a topological map with semantic information, such as a street or a sidewalk and crossing the street and high level path planning in interaction with humans. Also very important uh, to solve this uh, problem successfully was the human robot communication strategy, so the dialogue structure. So here you can see what I have mentioned also already. Uh, so in principle, you have uh, the in introduction. So the, the robot would say, my name is Ace, can you please help me? And then uh, it would ask for, in the second step, it would ask for the path to Marienplatz. So it's actually asking about the goal location. And then it says, oh, you, you mean that way, and shows a picture of the rough area that people have pointed to, and then uh, would ask also for a distance to go, like here, you see the camera image uh, where people have pointed to, and then it would ask the person, what, uh, what kind of distance should I go in this, uh, in this direction? And eventually Ace would say, thank you very much for your help, and, and go off. Um, so here, um, uh, this gives also more detail about this um, uh, dialogue system architecture. Again, you have cameras, landmarks, microphones, uh, speakers. Uh, you have here a lot of, uh, lot of, of course, 
uh, parsing eventually an interpreter and also a vocalizer. So the robot is actually able to interact and talk to people. This actually, this down here shows also the, the lips mimicking the speech process. Yeah, this is uh, a very, uh, very brief uh, glimpse into what I said, the misinformation problem. Uh, so it's actually uh, when you detect, you have a lot of sources of misinformation. You might have a problem with misdetection. You have misrecognition. Uh, so in this case, you would probably uh, start to ask some questions like where, what, why, and so on. So you would ask people back. Um, then you have a language problem, you have a knowledge problem. So there's a lot of, a lot of sources uh, for misinformation to be sorted out. And um, this uh, also very briefly shows the natural language route description. Uh, so you see here an example up here, um, along a land, landmark road, go for about 100 meter at landmark church, turn left. So this is basically the way uh, also, the goal and the path is represented in in human robot interaction in this case, and uh, you have also here to reason about the alternatives. So you see that the robot might might be able to achieve the same, uh, but has to turn this around. And there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, research questions also in this area. I think I'll leave it at that because uh, going into the details here is. Uh, there's a lot of details. I will also briefly mention here the human pose estimation. Uh, so here you see uh, it's a number of cameras. It's also upgraded at the moment to the Kinect sensor to be included. We have stereo vision and also probably uh, special cameras. And then eventually uh, you would like to get a pose estimation of the human. And the way we did this uh, in one dissertation completed in Munich is uh, First look for candidate humans, then uh, do some nearest neighbor clustering, eventually fit a human model with 28 degrees of freedom into that clustered data. And then uh, by doing that, you can have a representation in the end like this, where you see one arm po pointing to a particular direction. This, this actually really worked well. Yeah, so outdoor navigation, the next problem. Um, I also see, uh, See uh, some people already. Um, okay, that's fine. Um, the efficient navigation among, among humans. This is really important. So you see here a very crowded environment, people moving around. Human motion prediction is one of the key questions in this problem because you have many people moving around at the same time. You need some something like a kino dynamic planner, and also some safety assessment of partial trajectories. So safety is also. Uh, one of the really important issues here, because if you have a conservative safety assessment in a crowded pedestrian area, the robot will eventually come conclude that it cannot move anywhere because it's too dangerous, because there's too many people around. And this is, uh, this is really uh, interesting, and uh, conservative safety estimation in this particular case will not take you uh, to the goal in the city. Um, there's also, you see here some examples, and uh, one of the problems is also there's a lack of standards and the legal embedment is really difficult. So at one point when we started the experiment, we also tried to talk to insurance companies, and that was quite an interesting discussion because the insurance companies just didn't know how to talk to us. Yeah, so um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the acceptance here as well. So here you see one of the videos, one of the first videos. This is actually with version 2.0. So the robot's just driving around and we captured video of uh, how would people react to the robot. So this is a typical case where two people just watch it, uh, but don't really approach it immediately. So even though the robot talks to them, they just uh, look very skeptical. <laughs> now something happens.
they're not uh, people are not afraid either so you can see you're really moving them closely into the uh, to the robot uh, fortunately we had a bumper system here as the last resort emergency stop so we didn't hurt anybody but um, some people got really close to the robot and after these uh, initial experiments it looked quite promising that people would uh, have a high acceptance and willingness to interact and that's uh, when we uh, then carried out the full experiment. So let me discuss the final results. Um, so we had this navigation trial, as you have seen in the video. Uh, it's about 1.5 kilometers. So the way from the university to Marienplatz is roughly that. We also, if you want to go to the website, there's also a Google, Google Earth uh, fly-through of this distance. Might be interested in looking at that. It takes about five, it took the robot about five hours and it interacted with about 38 humans. Uh, so this might sound slow. And it's actually one of the, uh, one of my colleagues, Tamim, pointed out to me in the break, that this might actually be a benchmarking measurement. So the time for the robot it takes to reach the goal location inside the city center might be one of the interesting benchmarking uh, benchmarking tests for such kind of robots. And uh, it's actually uh, quite interesting, this idea, because five hours is maybe four times, or a little, maybe four to five times slower than the human performance. So if you set out the same problem to a human, uh, the human would also probably ask about 20 or more people. Uh, the human would need maybe one hour to solve this problem, uh, considering also the misinformation. It, he or she would be given. And uh, a factor of four to five is actually not too bad. In other areas like teleoperation, you usually uh, work with factors like uh, four to five slower than true human performance. Um, well, we had an additional study for acceptance where you can see we have 52 users, 39 male, and uh, we had a mean interaction time of one minute and completion in about 90 seconds. Uh, some aborted interactions, two age groups, more or less 50, below 50 and uh, older than 50. And uh, we have also detected three groups of people like the ignorers, the notices, and the interactors. So this was also quite interesting. So this might also be uh, due to the experiment uh, being, being performed in Germany. Um, a careful analysis of the interaction uh, using, uh, for example, a five-item Likert scale on the intuitiveness question. Uh, the result is significant that the interaction is actually intuitive, so we do not have, um, we do not see any problems in this area. Um, the sociality of interaction, that's a bit more, that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, so elderly people, um, they were quite, um, quite afraid of the robot and it uh, turns out uh, that uh, they answered the question one, uh, one ace reacted to my behavior and three uh, in a much less favorable way than others. 39 users accept the robot entering into intimate space for interaction. That's quite surprising because uh, usually humans don't allow other humans to enter their private space. So the private space is something, if you stretch out your arm, it's inside, inside what you can, like this. So this is your private space. So you don't let any other people in the private space, but people are ready to let robots into that space. This was uh, quite a surprising fact. Um, um, and uh, tw 12 people just accepted personal space and three social space, which are like further away. Uh, but quite surprising that people were except really accepting the robot coming very close. The social impact, uh, it's also, of course, because we uh, did the experiment in, in the normal city surrounding with, uh, without any people staging, um, it's just normal passes by, that not many people knew that such robots existed. And also people assumed that safety is granted because, I mean, it's a robot, it's not going to hurt me. And sometimes we also had uh, surprising facts. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, this is one of the surprising videos. So you see this man here. It's still going. 
yeah, hold the hand in front of the camera, still going, the robot's still going. And this is our PhD student, Yorgos Lidoris, who then explained why the robot still could see. Uh, because of the laser range finders, the robot was still able to see, and, uh, but this person like, was kind of having a very interesting interaction. Uh, so where's this project going? Uh, at the moment, we're we're involved in a Euro project, it's a European project, and uh, and we're trying to uh, push forward uh, this hardware and technology and also the science quite a bit. Uh, so you see here a recent prototype which was finished about uh, two two or three months ago. So this is a robot uh, hardware which now includes a very sophisticated uh, spring damper systems, uh, making the robot able to eventually also overcome some step like, like obstacles, and maybe also in the future uh, we might have a robot looking like that. Uh, these are like conceptual studies at the moment. So this project is going on still. It's funded by the European Union, and the older project has uh, received a lot of uh, interesting funding sources uh, before Euro was started. So the Euro project is now the only one remaining of this. Uh, so output from other projects have made this happen. So now um, I would like to talk a little bit about the engineering versus learning uh, issue. Uh, so I have uh, asked myself the question, so engineering and system integration. So I would, I would call this like, like the engineering approach uh, where you have a lot of engineering, computer science, trying to integrate complex systems. And I've uh, thought a little bit about uh, successes of engineering and system integration. And of course, one, one of the excesses is industrial robots. You have, of course, cars, aircraft, chips. Interesting about cars, aircraft, and chips is that all these complex technical systems, the human is in control in the end. None of these systems is autonomous at the moment. You have automated industrial environments where you have automation 24-7. So you have systems operating automatically. I'm not saying autonomously, I'm saying automatically in structured environments 24 hours, seven days a week. You have, of course, uh, safe, reliable, and dependable systems. And because a lot of engineering is, is uh, being performed, these systems are all also inherently optimal and robust where optimality, you could define energy optimal, um, resource optimal in terms of material ex materials used, and many things like that. Um, the grand challenges in this area is the next question I ask myself. And uh, I think one of the greatest challenges uh, for engineering and system integration is adaptation with variable system structure. So it's, for example, um, where you have drastic changes in, in a system. Maybe you have a, a manufacturing plant where one of the machines fails, or you might have a, a car where one of the tires is suddenly flat, uh, which has a dramatic uh, influence on the system performance and also on the system characteristics. Uh, this is uh, one of the challenges and so-called rare events. So. The reason why we do not at the moment have autonomous cars, so a car, like you, you go into the car and tell it to take you to the airport here in Thessaloniki. Uh, the problem is that you, on the way to the airport, it's almost certain that the car will discover children playing soccer and maybe a ball. Suddenly a ball comes flying onto the road where you might have to infer that the child is running after the ball and you have to stop the car and not, not, to, not to hit the children. And uh, it's really a hard problem to engineer these rare events. We also, of course, have rare events uh, recently, very sad events uh, uh, in Japan. Uh, there's also some things you cannot do using engineering and system integration. So I think one of the one of the complex system, really complex systems. So if you look at, for example, plants with thousands of actuators, thousands of sensors, where you have very complicated manufacturing systems, this remains difficult. People are actually working on this in the area of automation and engineering, but it's a hard problem. 
And uh, uh, one of the things, uh, when I talk to my control theory colleagues, and I tell them we should do more in data-driven control, which is like um, what machine learning is doing. You use a huge amount, huge amounts of data, and then you reason, you learn about the data, you try to cluster them. Uh, I think control and automation should be doing uh, the same, working on purely data, massive amounts of data, and trying to achieve something like safety, optimality, and performance. Well, same questions for learning and embodied AI. So I have um, a short list of success stories because I'm not an expert per se in this area, but we have Mr. Embodiment with us today. So, so <laughs> Rolf Pfeiffer can probably augment this list. Uh, I think uh, from my personal point of view, learning and embodied AI have grand uh, successes in uh, areas like RoboCup, uh, grand challenges uh, and, and the like. We also had a marketing fad. Uh, I call this marketing fad. We had a time uh, many, many years ago where we had some artificial neural networks in the air conditioning uh, systems or even washing machines. Uh, but that uh, that is over now, I, I would say. Of course, we have uh, modern machine learning, mathematical machine learning, but also uh, algorithmic machine learning in Google, Amazon, Facebook, and so on. There's a lot of uh, interesting things going on in that area. Um, we also have grand challenges. Uh, I think uh, one of the grand challenges, if you start to learn uh, or embody cognition, if you use embodied cognition to self-evolve a system, I think one of the key issues to be solved is provable stability. So in case of the robots we have seen, like the robots, uh, trying to dance or bring themselves about in the environment, I mean, safety might be not so critical, but if you have a self-evolving learning control system from first principles to, draw, to fly an aircraft, you uh, might have a problem uh, to prove the stability to the customers and the companies wanting to buy this aircraft. I think also one of the areas where people in, in embodied cognition, embodied AI, AI have uh, tried to stay away from is uh, any uh, systems where you handle a significant physical, significant amount of physical energy. Because if you start to handle physical energy, the danger involved with energy in the system increases dramatically. And I, I'm, I think that's one of the open issues that you really should try to increase the amount of physical energy energy in the systems and still safely do that. Um, also, what I would like to see personally is a self-evolving embodied cognitive, cognitive robot, which is 24-7 and does something useful. I'm not saying that it should practice like how to dribble a ball like a basketball robot or how to kick a ball into the goal. I'm saying it should do something which is goal-oriented and, and people would like infer intention into this robot. And also there might be uh, a very interesting area in the in what also uh, Rolf Pfeiffer mentioned, developmental psychology combined with emerging manipulation. That might also be a very fruitful area. I have also uh, a take-home message maybe uh, of cannots and do nots. Uh, so, wh what I said, uh, safety, optimality, robustness is really hard to prove in any self-emerging embodied cognitive system. And I also uh, have recently discovered working with many I I interesting, many interested students from different areas, ranging from mathematics to biology and also computer science. Um, there are some things you just don't learn because you know them and uh, one of the things you don't learn is that you if you build a robot uh, and it, it has a forward kinematics it also has an inverse kinematics and there's no reason why you should learn that it's also some people try to learn the uh, learn how velocity what velocity is or other properties of their own body I don't believe it's uh, the right starting point for learning algorithms I think we should use as much as we can from our engineering knowledge about the system and then start learning on a much higher level. So the very simple take home message for you before we come to the benchmarking test. Uh, so 
this is my recommendation how to avoid the fat problem is that we should combine, eventually combine in the next five to 10 plus years, we should combine the 24 seven safe automation in structured environments, the engineering, we should combine that with learning and embodied AI where you have data driven, which is data driven in unstructured environments and eventually uh, come to something which is 24 seven physical human robot coexistence. And again, here, the physical interaction, I think it's one of the key issues and innovative drivers. So let's uh, try the benchmark test, if uh, Vincent still allows me that. Uh, he's, he nodded, so I'm okay to go. Uh, so I have brought a video of one of my co-workers in Munich. So Sandra Hirsche, Professor Sandra Hirsche from Munich, has developed a robot which does something interesting. And uh, I want you uh, to watch the video. I will not comment. And after, after the video is done, I will just ask you one question. The following sequence shows the robot successfully pocketing five balls in a row. bit short. Now we're going at 10 times the speed. I was still, Sandra told me that uh, still working on the on the air shots, aerials and things. Okay, now the question is, uh, who thinks this robot is cognitive? <laughs> Zero? Yeah, too many experts in the room. <laughs> well, actually, of course it's not. Um, not per se. There's a lot of room, I think, for learning and a lot of interesting algorithms. But if you look at this video version, which is also downloadable from the website, you will see that, of course, we have cameras, cameras up there. We have an overhead camera and uh, very sophisticated vision processing, some special structured lighting, and a lot of computation and modeling of the ball. And you, you're welcome to ask questions in a minute, please. No, I don't think so. We can debate that later. <laughs> um, 
Okay. So I think uh, I will leave it at that and be happy about your questions. Um, and just uh, the closing slide. I think we are up for new frontiers in the intersection of very interesting engineering and embodied cognition. Thank you very much. <laughs>